Greetings, I'm Keith Whitaker from Wise Council Research, and welcome to this brief introduction to Plato's dialogue, The Theotetus. The Theotetus is the Platonic dialogue on science or knowledge. Now, our world today is suffused with science, and yet few of us truly understand this science. Its power certainly outstrips our wisdom. To come to grips with this state of affairs and the transformation of science and modernity that led to it, it may help us to return to the pre-modern teaching about science or knowledge. That teaching begins with Plato's dialogue, The Theotetus. Now, the scene of The Theotetus is Athens in 399 BC, near a gymnasium. Socrates, the main character, is already an old man. Socrates initiates the conversation, and he carries it along at great length. Later we learn that while he was in jail facing the charges that led to his execution, Socrates narrated this long dialogue to a foreigner named Euclides. And before his death, Socrates even went so far as to correct the transcript that Euclides wrote down. Given these circumstances, we can say that the Theotetus is Plato's most voluntary dialogue. It is also perhaps the most skeptical of Platonic dialogues. The overall conclusion of the Theotetus is that Socrates does not even know what knowledge itself is. So here at the end of his life, far from possessing knowledge about the soul or the afterlife or even what he calls human wisdom, it would seem that Socrates met his indictment, his trial, and even his death, not knowing what knowledge itself is. After its introductory frame, the dialogue proper falls into two main parts. The first very short part is Socrates' conversation, first with Theodorus and then with Theotetus, considering the questions, who is Theotetus? And is knowledge the same as wisdom? The second much longer part is Socrates' conversation, mainly with Theotetus, about the question, what is knowledge? Now, how do they get to this question? Socrates begins the dialogue proper, reminding everyone of his interest in philosophy and in promising young men, the very interests that are about to get him indicted. Theodorus, a foreigner and a geometer, introduces Socrates to his student Theotetus. Theodorus claims to know that Theotetus has a very good soul. This claim to know Theotetus' soul sparks the inquiry into knowledge. Now, there's much more that we could say about the introduction to Theotetus, the character. Let's leave it at this. His introduction recapitulates the main issues at play in the Theotetus, the dialogue. We learn his name, for instance. Is the name the thing? Socrates knows him by his father's family, the source in a certain way. Socrates also knows him by sight, his form or his look. Theotetus looks a lot like Socrates, so he's ugly. And Theodorus claims to know his character, his essence, or his being. So much for the brief first part of the dialogue proper. In the second very long part of the dialogue, in response to Socrates' question, what is knowledge, Theotetus gives three main answers. First, he answers that knowledge is the arts and sciences. Second, he says that knowledge is nothing other than perception. Third, he says that knowledge is true opinion. Let's look at each of these answers in turn. Now, Theotetus' first answer, that knowledge is various arts and sciences, is muddy and unclear. He must shape it up. But it does point to a possible answer that would unify his list, applied mathematics. Now, Theotetus was a mathematician himself. To help himself out of the difficulties posed by his first answer, he cites the attempt that he and his yet friend young Socrates made to unify what we would call the irrational numbers in one look or form, he says. Now, so the form would seem to hold out some possibility of being knowledge, but they don't explore that any further. Rather, Theotetus is, expresses how surprised he is about how hard it is for him to answer Socrates' question, what is knowledge? He becomes rather daunted. So Socrates tries to encourage Theotetus, by telling Theotetus that he is pregnant and that he, Socrates, is a midwife who can help Theotetus give birth to his thoughts. Well, as you can imagine, Theotetus rejects Socrates' claim that he, Theotetus, is pregnant, which leads Socrates to make a long speech about his art as a midwife. 
The main points from this speech are that Socrates claims that he can exercise this art so well because he is, he says, barren of ideas himself. Also, that unlike female midwives, Socrates uses this art on young men to help them give birth to their thoughts. And that again, unlike regular midwives, his, his art helps people not only give birth, but also to distinguish the true offspring from false ones. This last result means that the would-be parents often end up angry at Socrates. So like female midwives, Socrates says he must take care and even hide the true potential of his art. Now notice for a moment what's going on here. Socrates is claiming to have a certain knowledge, knowledge of the art of midwifery. However, when we look at the rest of Socrates' life, he certainly hardly seems barren of ideas. And the rest of the dialogue undercuts this claim of knowledge. So to review for a moment, after his first attempt at an answer, Theotetus is dispirited. Socrates tries to encourage him. Theotetus' problem, he says, is that he claims to know himself, just as Theodorus claimed to know him, by experience. Socrates' account of midwifery implies that experience is at odds with knowledge. It's precisely the people who don't have experience who have knowledge. So, in response, Theotetus abandons experience. He often offers a second answer to the question, what is knowledge? Namely, the answer that knowledge is nothing other than perception. This answer upends the possibility of his favorite activity, mathematics. It hardly goes with his own experience. Theotetus claims to have gotten this second answer from the Sophist Protagoras, a man very famous for his teaching and the subject of Plato's dialogue, the Protagoras. Following Protagoras, Theotetus says that knowledge is sense perception. The senses are bodily, so knowledge is bodily. If Protagoras is right, then we know only the sensations our senses give birth to. We never know what an object really is. For example, mathematics would amount to an abstraction, a human construction. Once he sees this, Theotetus begins to doubt his Protagorean answer begins to wonder. To encourage his wonder, Socrates explains that philosophy is like the rainbow, the messenger of the gods. So he, Socrates, will attempt to interpret the secret teaching of these wise men, like Protagoras. He will strip their myth of its mythical trappings. Once stripped, their teaching is that the beginning or first principle of the all is motion. Sense and sensation are not things in themselves. Nothing is by itself. In fact, we must excise the verb to be from all of our speech. Theotetus is not sure he likes how this myth tastes. So at this point, Socrates engages Theotetus' teacher, Theodorus, who was actually a companion of Protagoras while Protagoras was still alive. Socrates criticizes Protagoras' famous teaching that man is the measure of all things. As a sort of joke, doesn't it reflect only Protagoras' perspective? What about the perspective of other people, or even animals? Theodorus, who's an old man, is too attached to his friend to question his teaching. He backs out of the investigation. Though Socrates returns to Theotetus and his answer that knowledge is nothing but perception. What about memory, though? Do we know what we remember, but do not see? What about when we close our eyes? What about when we have one eye open and one eye closed? Can someone who knows something also not know it? Theotetus feels defeated, but Socrates claims this defeat is not fair. They're behaving like clever men, not philosophers. In defense of Protagoras' teaching, Socrates calls upon Protagoras himself, in the form of his ghost, to speak. So Protagoras rises up out of the ground, at least up to his shoulders, and he says that Socrates is just trying to frighten this boy. Socrates is trying to win through telling jokes. Yes, Protagoras admits, he does teach relativism. But he's far from denying that there's such a thing as wisdom or a wise man. The wise man, he says, changes what appears and is bad for each of us into what appears and so is good. For example, Protagoras says, orators or public speakers make cities opine 
useful things instead of harmful ones as just. This ability to change perceptions makes some people wiser than others, even though no one opines falsely. So Protagoras says that on the one hand, each man is the measure of all things, and on the other hand, that there are some people who are wiser than others. The solution to this apparent difficulty, this contradiction, begins with the practicality of the wise man's wisdom. He can shape others' perceptions, and hence what is for them. That practical wisdom rests upon a theoretical basis. The wise man sees more clearly than others do that the good is the useful. The good is relative to each man or city, but the human being or a city may not see the good for him or itself accurately. That is where the wise man comes in. Now in response, Socrates offers a different picture of the wise man in a speech he gives about the philosopher Thales. The wise man, this wise man, he says, is impractical, wholly theoretical. This wise man seeks to assimilate himself to the divine, staring up at the stars so that he even falls into a well, rather than to spend time on politics and other things that are at his feet. It is not clear to what degree Socrates himself ascribes to this description of the philosopher. Unlike Thales, he doesn't fall into any wells while looking at the stars. But neither is he an orator. Once he lets the shade of Protagoras sink back into the earth, Socrates returns to the inquiry with Theotetus about knowledge as perception. They take up the question of whether we perceive by the senses or through the senses. Socrates postulates this idea that allows us to perceive commonality, whether that's the soul or something else that one must call the soul. This idea allows us to perceive being, likeness, unlikeness, same and other, and even the relations of beautiful, ugly, good and bad. It does so, Socrates says, through analogizing or reckoning up or gathering up perceptions. Data or observations would not be knowledge themselves. So then, perception and knowledge would not be one and the same. But the question remains, is knowledge altogether different from perception, or are they somehow connected? Does the soul know separately from perception, or does it know through perception? The dialogue seems to ignore the latter possibility, focusing instead on the former. That's why Theotetus abandons his answer, that knowledge is nothing other than perception. But Theotetus does not give up. He offers a third answer to the question, what is knowledge? Perhaps, thinking about the soul, he says it is true opinion. In response, Socrates asks how false opinion would be possible. After all, if there's no false opinion, then there could hardly be true opinion. To help come to an answer to this question, Socrates offers a famous image. He likens the soul to a block of wax on which the things imprint their forms. Using this image, Socrates tries to come up in Kate with cases in which we confuse matters and make mistakes. His analysis is, to put it mildly, confusing. In addition, as he admits, his analysis continually relies on the word no. The wax image just leads them in a circle. So Socrates makes one more start into what he calls the river of the speech, that knowledge is true opinion. He gives the example of orators and attorneys. He says that they show that true opinion is not the same as knowledge. Their work, after all, reminds us of the distinction between eyewitness testimony and hearsay. Judges and jurors possess only hearsay, what they hear from someone else say about something. They possess only opinion. Witnesses, on the other hand, see. They have knowledge, or at least the starting point of knowledge. Now, this example reminds Theotetus of something that he said he once heard someone say. In other words, it prompts him to share some hearsay. This other person said to him that knowledge is true opinion with logos. But what is Logos? Socrates says that when he was young, he heard people talk about the elements or first things as being unknowable in themselves. For if they were knowable, it would be in the light of other, more primary things. But their combinations, the combinations of these elements, are knowable. This is Socrates' first attempt at an explanation of what Logos is, the combination of these elements or letters. Theotetus likes this account of Logos. But, Socrates adds, 
How can we know a combination but not its elements? Is it because each combination has a look or separate from its parts? But what's the difference between all the elements and the whole? Theotetus can't see any difference. And at any rate, the way we learn combinations, such as words, is by first distinguishing their elements, such as their letters. So they seem again at a dead end. So they return once more to the definition that knowledge is true opinion plus logos. Again, what is logos? Socrates offers three more possibilities. The first is, in essence, spoken language. But almost everyone can express his or her opinions in speech. So this logos would add nothing to true opinion to make it knowledge. The second possibility is that logos is the account of something produced by going through its elements in the right order. However, someone may correctly account for the elements in one case, but not knowing each element truly may misplace them in another. They give the example of spelling two names with similar letters. Such a person could be said to have true opinion and logos in the sense of the correct order, but he or she could hardly be said to be a knower. The third possibility is one that Socrates ascribes to the many, he says. Namely, that logos is speaking the sign by which one thing differs from all others. He offers a definition of the sun as an example. He says the sun is the brightest heavenly body. Now this definition seems fine until they examine it more closely. Then it seems clear that they have only opinions about the differences among things. And even if they have knowledge of the differences among things, how do they have that knowledge? That's the whole question. They seem once more to be defining knowledge in terms of knowledge. So at last they give up the attempt to define knowledge as true opinion, even with Logos. Theotetus agrees that he is no longer pregnant. Socrates' art has cleaned him out of false opinions. As a result, if he does become pregnant in the future, he'll become pregnant with better things, Socrates says, or at least he'll be less harsh and gentler to others, since he does not think that he knows what he does not know. Socrates ends the dialogue by saying that he is going off to the porch of the King Archon to answer the indictment that Meletus has brought against him. We know that this indictment will end in his trial and his execution. These parting words bring to mind Socrates' statement about knowledge in the Apology. There he says that the one thing he knows is that he does not know anything noble and good. He knows that he does not know. Here, Theotetus thinks that he does not know what he does not know. So at the end of this most skeptical dialogue, Socrates is not actually as bereft of knowledge as Theotetus is. To put this point another way, the fact that Socrates has shown Theotetus that Theotetus was full of errors implies that a true account of knowledge is possible. Now that true account of knowledge does not ex appear explicitly in the Theotetus. Perhaps instead we the readers must bring the true account to our reading of the dialogue. It may appear in just what we have barely begun to do, in the collecting or gathering up of the various answers and comparing them with one another. Thank you for joining me for this brief introduction to Plato's Theotetus. I hope you enjoyed it, and please check out the other videos of introductions to Platonic Dialogues here at Wise Council Research. Thank you.